All right, it's 11.25, I guess I'll, uh, I'll get going. Uh, today I'm gonna be talking about uh, Cloud Native Java with OpenJ9. Um, I'll talk more about OpenJ9 as we get going, but it's basically another, it's an alternative open source Java VM that you could uh, be using in your cloud environment. Uh, and I believe it would actually be a big help uh, and improvement and cost savings for you to be running this Java VM in your environment. Uh, my name is Charlie Gracie. I am a, uh, the garbage collection architect uh, at IBM Runtimes for uh, the J9 Java Virtual Machine. Uh, and I've been working on VM technology for about 13 or 14 years. Kind of feel a bit bad that every time I present that it gets longer, a bigger number. Uh, some contact information for me if you want to get in touch, Twitter, GitHub. Uh, they're all easy ways to get in touch with me. Uh, some important disclaimers. Uh, don't base any of your business uh, uh, decisions on what I say today without verifying them yourself. Things are subject to change, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, so today, uh, I'm going to sort of quickly cover uh, the economics of cloud and Java. I assume most people are aware of this, but I'll quickly go through it just so that I can set things up. Then I'll talk about Java for the cloud and OpenJ9. Uh, talk about some of the features that uh, OpenJ9 has that I believe will actually be uh, quite helpful for people uh, running in the cloud. I'll give a quick demo. Uh, it's nice to talk about the results, but I'd like to actually show you these wins, so we'll hopefully see that all of my stuff works and we'll do a live demo. And then I'll go through wrap up covering some of the results and uh, opening it up for any quick questions if we have time. Uh, so part one, cloud economics uh, of Java. So in, in the cloud, footprint is really king. Uh, everybody is probably well aware that you are paying mostly for your gigabytes per hour uh, of RAM. So this is really the new measurement cost that you're beholden to when you're working in the cloud. Uh, if everybody is familiar with Java, it can be somewhat of a pig on memory at times, uh, and has been over the years actually sort of optimized to be running on a giant system. Uh, so there's the, the myth with uh, Java is that RAM is cheap, there's plenty of it, and you can just add more RAM. That's true when you're running on-premise and you actually have a dedicated machine to run some application, but as you move towards the cloud, that's not actually true. The, act, the reality is application footprint is very important to actually the cloud providers themselves and to uh, applications running. The users, it's a clear thing, you're gonna pay by the amount of RAM you're using, so any improvements in RAM can actually save you real dollars. And for the providers, Smaller footprints actually help them in a way as well because they actually improve their density. They have these really large machines and they want to virtualize them as much as possible, so smaller footprint actually improves the density per machine for them. So the, the big trends are these big machines being virtualized into smaller machines uh, and microservices. See so a really big push there, and this is actually increasing memory usage. Uh, in Java in particular, so the Java VM footprint is, a really, is really important. So there's a, there's a distinction I want to make sure we uh, clear up here. So the on-disk image size of the VM or whatever runtime you're doing, that actually is very relevant to the cloud providers themselves. Uh, this is where they would improve their density in a lot of cases, and it also if you're actually migrating instances around across from one uh, image to another, the copy times of doing that actually are also uh, important here. Virtual memory footprint is in particularly important for thir a lot of 32-bit applications, so if you've moved some older applications to the cloud, this is important. But that's not really gonna be the focus of my talk today. It's actually gonna be on physical memory footprint, your RSS. Uh, this is what's very relevant for your applications. A lot of the time, this is how you got more performance as you threw more heap at your Java VM, take those nasty GC pauses out of the picture, 
uh, and consume as many resources as possible on this machine. As well as the Java VM being a problem uh, in this area, it's something that needs to be improved. Your application itself, when you were running on these very large machines with lots of RAM, could easily get more RAM because it was super cheap, small little things weren't always paid attention to in your application. Are you allocating a bunch of extra objects for every transaction you don't really need to? Uh, have you in keeping some debug information around at runtime or extra logging that doesn't really have to be there that's keeping your footprint much larger than it needs to be? And this is just a simple example that even a small drip can actually waste substantial um, amounts of memory, oh, sorry, of water uh, over a, a year. So this is something that as an application developer now, you may actually, as you're working in the cloud, have to spend a bit more time looking into and figuring out this part of your application as well. So what does all this mean to Java developers? Changing your XMX directly affects your cost. This is very easy for anyone in your business chain to f understand and follow, because if you shrink it down by, say, half, they'll save half their money on every run. Um, the net effect to this is really that you're going to be tuning your application to fit into specific RAM sizes. So a lot of uh, cloud providers will actually charge you based on some sort of increments of different amounts of RAM sizes. So a 64 meg and under is a certain price, under 128 megs or 512 megs are different price points, or that's when they increase the price. So you may actually see a drive to run your application, move it down from the 512 meg to say the 128 meg just to save more money as well. So for this, you'll need to understand where your memory is being used, and it may actually drive you to switch other, to other components they're using. You might be using an open source component for something, but this one may actually consume more memory, so you may switch to another one even though it causes you a bit more grief in your application programming itself. It's a bit harder to use with those things because the trade-off might actually be a significant win for your company in terms of uh, how much money they pay to run these things. Uh, and the big thing is, any small increase in uh, one service can actually add up to huge money as you scale out. So if you have multiple concurrent instances running to handle your workload pressure, you may actually pay pretty significant money here, even though it's just a small increase in this one service. So part two, Java for the cloud. Um, I talked about things you might have to change, but the VM itself should actually be able to help out a lot here with improving uh, your ability to run uh, and uh, save money and have a better environment in the cloud. Uh, so quite quickly here, uh, OpenJ9 uh, was, uh, is another version of uh, a Java virtual machine. Uh, it was open sourced in uh, September 2017. It's not a new VM. This has actually been IBM's Java virtual machine since the 90s. Uh, so it's just now been open sourced. You might have lots of questions about why we did that. We have all kinds of talks and information, but quickly, it's just to actually be able to get out and be more involved with open source communities. Uh, lots of people are working in the open source and would prefer to work with those types of tools. So it's a direction we're going to actually see if we can get more uh, outreach with the different communities. Uh, to get your VM, um, there's a great uh, website called Adopt Open JDK. It's actually being run by the London Jug. They actually are producing Open JDK binaries with Hotspot, with Open J9, and any other vendor of a VM that has an open source VM, and you can go download pre built binaries. This sort of removes the distinction of where you go get it and what happens to be in your runtime at any one time. Uh, depending on where you're getting it, this is a great place. Uh, the one last thing about uh, Adopt is they actually also push Docker containers built up that you can grab as a base with all of the different JVMs as well. Uh, and I'll show a bit more about this later as I'm talking about some of my demos. So why is OpenJ9 good in the cloud? Well, I'm going to take a big step back into the 90s. Um, it was originally started out as an MEVM. Um, 
If anyone's familiar with like the most iconic phone in the world, this was running Java back in the day for your games and lots of other little things on the, on the phone. So Java ME actually at that time had a lot of uh, requirements that you may seem that feel similar uh, to what you're going to be doing in the cloud. They, had a very, they required a very small footprint uh, on disk and at runtime. Uh, they had very limited RAM. We're talking small numbers of megabytes here, 4, 8, 16 if you were lucky. Um, but usually you had some more space in ROM, so that actually helped make some decisions about what you could do with your application. If you could burn things into ROM, that actually gave you a bit more space. They, had, they required very fast startup. If you're launching your Java game 10, 20, 30 seconds, you're not going to be wanting to play if it's not started up. And they wanted a quick, immediate ramp up because you don't want your game to actually accelerate or change as you've been going. So they want a very consistent feel to how that's actually running. So, and that's another differentiation is startup is getting up to the point where, uh, in my terms of to the point where you can run your application main and ramp up would be till you get sort of peak throughput, how long it takes you to go from your transaction in, a, in that type of world from taking 30 seconds down to your one second at, high, at your highest throughput. So the cloud, it's very similar. It needs small footprint. They want a fast startup. And the quick immediate ramp up is really sort of key to also saving you money and your gigabytes per hour. If you're running your transactions very quickly at your max throughput, that means that when you start up a VM for some sort of like serverless or a quick microservice, you're actually getting your throughput right away. You don't have this 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour to get to peak throughput because you might not actually run that long. It might only be 30 seconds, two minutes. Uh, so you need this very quick uh, ramp up as well. So some of the key features in uh, OpenJ9 that I believe actually really help in this area and it will be quite useful in the cloud is our shared classes cache. Um, this is the quick options. The first one just enables it. Uh, there's all kinds of sub options you can look up later. It's very well documented. And the big one I'm calling out here is the size. So how big do you want your cache? Um, shared classes cache is really doing a couple of things. So the first one is it actually was used originally to cache our class files. The class file format in Java, to be quite honest, is not very great for the VM. So when we're loading these classes, we actually load it up and turn it into our own format that makes it much easier for us to use and optimize. But if you think back to our old days as ME, uh, Java ME developers, if we had to put all of the stuff in RAM, that's very limited. So what we figured out was there's actually lots of parts of a, J a Java class file that actually do, do not change based on your runtime. So what we actually do is we divide this class file into a ROM and a RAM class. Very well named because of what they were used for originally. And the ROM class is basically a position independent, uh, movable uh, piece of code that is the same. If you load the class A 10 times, you would get the same ROM class for it. To basically, at runtime, if you were changing fields or things within an instance of that, those things would be tracked through the RAM class. So with the, RAM, with the shared classes, what you would see is if you had multiple JVMs, you would actually have some ROM classes and some RAM classes. But where the big payoff actually comes is when we actually put these ROM classes in a cache. So at this point, they're in a memory mapped file that they actually would end up being shared across all of them. So when you load up a class, the first thing you would do is you would actually go check, is it in my RAM class already? Or is it in the shared classes cache? Yes. You've already got this pre-built piece of data for you already for that class. Um, that improves your startup. And it actually makes for a, a quite a bit smaller footprint if you're running multiple instances on the same piece of hardware. Because this memory would actually only be uh, account at once, and all of the other versions of the VM, instances of the VMs could actually share the same data. Another feature that we actually get through the shared classes cache is dynamic AOT. 
AOT is actually uh, stands for ahead of time compile. So this is actually for uh, JIT compiled code. What it actually does is when you're in startup mode, our dynamic AOT cache will actually check to see when it's time to JIT a method, if it should JIT it. If, it's, if it should, that is it in the cache, use it exactly the same as we'd use a ROM class, so it's actually much quicker to get to it. You don't have the time to compile. Uh, if not, go compile it and then stash it in the cache for the next time. So with shared classes and AOT, you start to now have a distinction on startup of a cold and a warm startup. The cold startup would be the first time as you're populating the cache. And then once you've run through your application once, uh, the, you would all be warm runs after that because then you would hopefully be getting all kinds of hits from your cache. And this second and more uh, runs of the warm cache, that's actually where you start to see some pretty significant startup time improvements from simply just adding the command line option and providing a bit of space. Uh, so in general, the AOT loads are over 100 times faster than compiling some of the complicated uh, JIT methods. Um, but there is a slight downside. This AOT code, because it was, is actually shareable and not as highly optimized, um, sorry, because it's shareable, we can't actually do some of the high-end optimizations. And you can't always make certain guarantees about which classes would be loaded in the system already and things. So it actually is slightly less optimized than a full compile that the JIT would do uh, in your normal runtime. But because we actually have recompilation uh, in the VM, you would run the AOT version for a while. If it's still something that needs to be optimized, the JIT would just kick in and go compile it again and optimize it further. Um, a few of the other things that uh, are there is we actually have this X quick start option. This is mostly a JIT tuning option. Uh, and this option will actually reduce the counts that it would take before you would go compile a method, uh, tweak a bunch of the other decision making so you actually compile quicker. It's to actually give you the quickest startup possible to get through your application and up to the point where you're running your main. Uh, this again, it would be more targeted towards sort of short-lived tasks. Um, short-lived, I'm not talking in the small numbers of seconds or milliseconds here. This is probably in small t minutes to tens of minutes. Um, and it may have uh, some, it may limit your peak throughput. And we'll see some of that uh, later on in some results. Uh, Xtune virtualized. This is sort of a, a grab bag option in our VM right now, where anytime we find out, figure out something that can help uh, in, the, um, in a virtualized environment, we sort of enable it under this option. So this will actually tweak some different options for the GC to tell it not to expand the heap as quickly, uh, uh, those types of things to favor reclaiming memory. So there's, it also enables some idle management. So if your application goes idle for a few minutes, why do you have all of this RAM still committed into the Java heap if we have free space that you're not using? Let's go contract it down and be even more aggressive on the little bit of free space we give you, because we can always go re-expand uh, re again later if we need it. So again, if you have some peaks where you're up and down in your uh, amount of transactions, this might actually come in very handy to reduce the amount you're paying at any one time. Uh, and it does other tweaks to improve startup and ramp up as well. This one has a smaller trade-off in performance, and it's usually around actually uh, GC times. You would have a usually a slightly more overhead in the number of GCs you would actually end up having. All right, uh, so part three, uh, some demo. Let's see if this works. I'll mirror my display so I can show you a few things. So what I have here, what I'm going to demo right now quickly is I have a Docker image. Uh, I have actually a few of them. I'll show you the Docker files quickly. I won't build it now because it takes about 30 minutes. That's not quite in my time slot here. Um, but I have one built for uh, Hotspot, one for OpenJ9 with no options, and one for OpenJ9 with the shared classes cache and quick start enabled. 
And I'll just show you how quickly this uh, application can start up. Uh, sorry, the container and the application will start up with this enabled. And then we can look uh, using some of the Docker statistics on the footprint and CPU that's being used after it uh, be is, becomes idle. Uh, so quickly, so it's a pretty uh, small Docker file. Mm. Sorry, you probably can't read it. I apologize. I thought it looked bigger. Um, basically, all it's doing is going and starting a base from one of the Adopt OpenJDK uh, uh, Docker images I mentioned before, where they build uh, the different VMs. Uh, going through, it's cloning a Spring uh, Pet Clinic demo um, to start up. That I, that's what I'm going to use later, and then it just has the simple Java command line to go launch this uh, this demo. So that's pretty straightforward. Uh, make sure I have nothing running right now. Perfect. Um, so that actually would have been built uh, and run. So now I'll just run it. And I won't adjust the screen until it's finished. I don't want to interfere. I picked this app uh, because it actually prints out a great uh, time at the bottom of how long it took to start up, which you probably can't see, which is 9.5 seconds. Um, I can run this a bunch of times. It's very consistent on my laptop, uh, but that would actually be for the uh, hotspot. Now the J9 one, all I did was pick a different VM. The Docker file for that one was just a different base. So here we go. No real difference in performance at this point. They both took about 9.5 seconds to start up. But if I go back here, sorry, I can't type. You can see this is the interesting part. For the two uh, applications running right now is the uh, memory. Um, the top one, I can tell you, is OpenJ9. I'll do a Docker PS in a second to prove it. But it's actually only using 162 megs versus the hotspot one, which is actually using 450 megabytes. So this was getting the application up and going. The CPU is uh, still going here. They slowly slow down. Both VMs actually become more idle over time. Uh, but that actually, right away, is quite an improvement in your footprint. Um, for, for just a simple application to start up, they, it's actually using less than 50% of the memory. So the next thing I'll actually start up is uh, one of the J9 ones with a shared classes cache. I've called this cache cold because it actually doesn't have a cache in it. It's going to actually build a shared classes cache while it's being launched. So I call this one the, the cold run, and when we see this image actually get loaded into the container, it's actually going to take longer. Uh, it's going to probably take about 11 or 12 seconds. Because this time it's actually going through, it's actually doing a lot of checks and getting only misses in the cache and doing a lot of writing out to the cache in your first startup. So if you were actually going to use the shared classes in your deployment, you would actually build your run. You could actually uh, mount a volume to actually have your shared classes cache so it could be shared across everything on the same physical machine uh, in there. Or you can actually just pre-populate your image as well. So it, it would increase the, your Docker image size by whatever the size of your cache is, but you could actually have it just pre-populated directly into your image. So yeah, this one took 11.5 seconds uh, to actually uh, speed things up. And you can see it's actually using even less memory. So I'm going to do Docker PS. And to save ourselves a little bit of time, I'm actually going to just commit the 
the current cache as one called warm. And then I'll just go run that guy. And since this actually now went and created the image based on the one that was there before, which would have a completely populated uh, shared classes cache, you can actually see that we started up in about 7.6 seconds. So we save about two seconds on startup of actually getting your, your container up and going out of nine seconds. It's actually pretty impressive to me. Um, and if we go back. And look at the Docker stats before I do that. I ah, cleared it anyway. All right, well, you can see all of the OpenJ9 ones are actually in the small numbers of hundreds of megabytes. And the top one is actually the warm cache. And the reason it has an even smaller footprint is it's actually getting the win of using the cache uh, that was uh, from the other one, I believe. Actually, no, sorry, I don't have a shared volume. That's not true. Um, they're always roughly within this small number of megabytes, depending on how much the idleness detection is kicked in, because that would actually be running here and moving things around as well. Um, so there, that's sort of my uh, quick demo here on the uh, different uh, improvements you can get quickly just by using some shared classes cache. And that it's actually quite relative, straightforward to do it. Uh, so I'll move on now to, uh, to wrap up quickly. The startup time with that quick demo was about 30% faster, and that's pretty much something you can measure across the board. The first few times we published this after OpenJ9 came out, a bunch of other people were like, oh yeah, sure, it's in some random benchmark. They've actually gone now and run their applications and have all uh, mostly come back and like been tweeting about it as well with this amount like in the 20 to 40 percent faster on startup. Uh, the footprint is 60 percent smaller with OpenJ9. Uh, that starts to be in the order of cost. You can run twice as many in your environment for the same price, or you can pay half as much uh, depending on how you look at it. So that's actually uh, pretty impressive. Um, something that we would have had to wait a little bit longer to see in the run was if we let the CPU uh, go down, OpenJ9 would actually only be triggering about 55, it would be triggering 55% fewer wake-ups, uh, and, and which is easily tracked uh, through uh, the PowerTop tool is what I use to gather this data on a longer run. Um, in, in this chart, we couldn't really, I didn't have time to show, but this is a run using um, DayTrader, and it's actually showing the difference between a few of the options. Um, so red is just OpenJDK9 with hotspot, and the blue is just a regular OpenJ9. Um, but it shows that we have a bit quicker rental, but that's not the, the, the thing I really want to call it here. It's actually the green line. So this is actually using a shared classes cache with AOT and using the Xtune virtualized. This is actually giving you so much more uh, ramp up than you could get in the, other, in the other two modes. And if you look compared to the hotspot one, you can actually run for a significant amount of time before you would actually get to where it would cross over. So if you're in some sort of serverless environment where your VM will be up and running for a few minutes, 5, 10 is usually about the refresh time of VMs there if they're being shared. This would actually give you all of the throughput, that, like max throughput that you're ever going to get very quickly without costing you any real throughput. Um, so sort of in the end here, uh, cloud is sort of new. I'll put that in quotes. Everything's really changing. Developers are learning a lot about how to actually work in this environment and to uh, how to save money, how to do things cost effectively there. Uh, the JVM itself is also doing this. There's lots we have to learn to be able to actually get through and make further improvements so that we can provide the best VM that there is for people. 
Um, and, and we have more things coming as we keep going on. Um, there's just uh, not as much time here to get into all the technical details of where we're going and things we're adding. Uh, but the VM itself will continue to improve as well. And that's it. Thank you. I think I ran right up two times, so I don't know if I have much time for questions, but um, I don't know if I have time to ask. I guess so if anyone has any questions, or I can quickly, yeah? Uh, I think you would still be able to see most of the benefits that I was showing. I'm not super familiar with Spring myself and the way things are loading up, but uh, with the shared classes cache and AOT, you should be able to. You just may need, if they're preloading a lot of things, you just may need a larger cache. So that's just something you could tune and start up uh, and change on your own and sort of measure. All right, if nobody has any other questions, I'll be around outside if you want to ask questions then too. But thank you guys so much for your time. <laughs>